Shalom. So how do we have the most meaningful life possible? How do we fill our time with things that are not only satisfying but meaningful in terms of long term, not just something short term, a fix? Well, first of all, in terms of how many years we have left, that's a very interesting question because there's a prominent professor at Cambridge who uh, recently was quoted in an interview in Parade Magazine who said that he thinks aging is a disease that will soon be conquered and the average person will live to a thousand barring any accidents. It kind of reminded me of the 2,000-year-old comic routine between Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, where Mel Brooks was just had surgery, and he was quipping that he felt like a 2,000-year-old man. So Carl Reiner couldn't resist, so he said, what does it feel like to be a 2,000-year-old man? And he said, uh, what was the earliest known language? The answer was basic rock. And why was the cross created? Well, it was easier to assemble than a Star of David. And tell me about Mar Marie Antoinette. Know her. I went with her in, in routines like that. But... Whatever happens, still the average person is not going to live that long. Uh, we have whatever years we are given. How do we make those years the most meaningful? Well, there were two issues in the popular culture this year that I think tried to give partial answers, and they were interesting as far as they went, but they were missing, I think, the most important thing. The first was the movie The Bucket List with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. Uh, Jack Nicholson was a gazillionaire who owned a lot of hospitals. He was a very, ran a tight ship for profit, two to a room. Morgan Freeman was this brilliant car mechanic, and they both were diagnosed with a deadly form of cancer and ended up in the same hospital room. Nicholson, of course, wanted his own room in his own hospital, but his assistant said, well, you've always said two to a room. And it's, at the beginning, they didn't like each other, but in the end, they be became best of friends. And one day, Morgan Freeman pulls out this yellow crumpled list, and Jack Nicholson wants to know what's on it. And uh, Morgan Freeman says that he had an, an exercise in school where his teacher said, you have to write all the things on this list that you want to do before you kick the bucket. Well, Nicholson had the wherewithal, and so he took his private jet, and the two of them went on a romp around the world, skydiving and climbing to see the guru and the highest peaks and uh, eating in the fanciest restaurants, all these great experiences. And uh, it, was, it was meaningful, and it was moving at times. But I, I, when it was all finished, and they both died in the movie, felt like something significant was missing. The second uh, is this notion of the last lecture by this Carnegie Mellon professor who at a young age was diagnosed with a deadly form of cancer and he gave this last lecture which was widely publicized, it was attended by lots of students, it was on the internet, there was a show about it and here was his advice. He said uh, that you have to have fun, dream big, ask for what you want, make time for what matters, look for the best in other people. And again, I was left feeling that those are all great ideas, but ultimately there, there's something missing from that. So what is missing? Well, Shlomo Karabach, a great rabbi, a Hasidic rabbi, uh, tells the story of an English professor at Hebrew University, or some university in Israel, who grew up religious but then became secular and he taught English literature. And he was uh, wounded on a, in a battle on the Golan, and he thought he was going to die. He was alone. He didn't think anybody knew where he was. And he tried to comfort himself with English literature, and it didn't do any good. And then he sort of feeling badly for himself. He said that the thing that gave me my, scholar, my scholarly interest throughout my life isn't really comforting in the end and isn't that substantive, and that's all I can pass on to my children. And in moments when they're really going to need it, they don't have the... The, the comfort and the support that they should have. And then, without even realizing, he remembered the prayers of his childhood. He started uttering them, and that's when he blacked out. And the next thing he knew, he woke up in a hospital and decided that he, he knew that religion was the thing that was most meaningful. Well, I think those are part of the keys of what's missing in both the bucket list and in this last lecture by this Carnegie Mellon professor. Now, in the backdrop of this was a study that was released in the foreword the week before Yom Kippur in 2008, which said that Jews are joiners. Most Jews do join a synagogue and other institutions, but they're the least religious in terms of daily prayer and Bible study uh, and observance of uh, the, the Jewish religious content of any of the major religious groups in America. And at the same time, New York Magazine uh, had an article in their 40th anniversary edition where they talked about the, the following. They said, the drama of Jewish acceptance into Gentile society, which played itself out in such a bloody and destructive way in 20th century Europe, has successfully been transformed in America into an inner conflict about how to present oneself to the outside world. And that has fueled countless episodes of Sex in the City, Seinfeld, and Curb Your Enthusiasm. 
The author says, I know plenty of Jews who protest the tribal insularity of their community and deny any attachment to religion by proclaiming their fervent attachment to universal values. They fear what it is that makes them so significantly powerful to others. In another video, I talked about the Sharansky book and his attacking that thesis and this notion he in the book he defends about how you can be universal and still maintain your strong identity and how desperately important that is. So what then is the answer? What is the key here? Well, uh, I just want to report to you about a finding uh, of somebody who studied 2,200 studies uh, and found that the correlation between religious faith and health was unbelievable in suggesting that the believing in a higher power can boost the spirit, more than just boost the spirit. Research shows that people who are religious, who attend church, mosque, and synagogue more than four times a month, are less likely to be depressed or feel chronic stress. They, they live seven years longer. People who believe in God often feel that in, in itself is the reward that gives life meaning. It's the sense of why God has created them for a certain purpose. I'm going to do another video on that issue, but I think that's really what was missing from both the bucket list and from this last speech. That really define true meaning in life. The stu 2,200 studies seem to suggest that the key is attaching yourself to a, a universal value of something that's beyond yourself. It's interesting, uh, when I'm recording this, we're getting to the very end of the Torah at Parshat HaAzinu, when the God is referred to over and over and over as a rock, a sewer, something that's enduring and stable and you can cling to, that is what is the key to a meaningful life. In the book of Ecclesiastes that we're going to read on Sukkot, the conclusion of that book says, the end and the sum of the matter is, to be in awe of God and observe the commandments. Everything else is vanity, vanity. And so, my friends, I think that is really what the conclusion of this question is. And I know I'm a rabbi, and this is what I'm supposed to say, but it's because I truly believe it, that we can do all of these fun things and have all these great adventures and, and, and of course, being invested in our family and our community and our work is all important, but... It's the religious quality of attaching ourselves to God and universal values of spirituality that, in the end, provide the most meaning.